Welcome to the channel, everybody. My name is Brooke Hiddink. I'm an e-commerce entrepreneur located in Dubai, originally from Canada. And today we're going to be doing my second ever Q&A. The response rate on the Google form I created was so high, I had like 60 questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna do half of them today and half of them next week. So if you submitted a question and I don't answer it here, just watch out for next week. I'll answer the rest that I don't cover today next week. Before we dive into it, if you could please hit subscribe on my channel below, I would greatly appreciate your support. If you could please like this video. If you have any questions or comments about anything that I say in this video, put them below. I'll answer any and all questions throughout. Again, I uh, really appreciate your support guys and we will dive right in. So question number one, can I start high ticket dropshipping if I do not live in the USA and I'm young? So yes, you can do high ticket dropshipping from anywhere in the world. You can start a business for anyone in the world in the US and sell within the US, or you can also do it in your home country, depending if there's a market for it. So some of my students do it in um, the UK and have already made sales since some success. And other ones have also done it in Australia and have also seen some early success. So it just really, you can do it from anywhere in the world and either sell in the US or you can do it in your home country, just depending if there's a market for it and there's suppliers, everything like that. Um, if you're young, I don't know how young you are, but if you can create a corporation, then yes, you can do it. There's 18, 17, 18 year olds in my program who have had success. But um, if you're not young enough, then you would probably have to get your parents to create your corporation. I'm not even sure if there's age limit restrictions on that, but you'd have to be able to create a, a corporation and open a business bank account essentially. Whether it's you or your parents, you would probably need to do that. Question two. Hi, Brooke. I just opened my LLC in the US. I live in Venezuela. So I'd like to know how sales tax would be if I'm foreign and my LLC is registered in Wyoming and how it would be the income tax. Thanks, man. You're awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So I'm not from Venezuela, obviously, so I don't know what your tax situation is like there. But I know if for sales tax, again, this is not tax or legal advice to get advice that you can rely upon. You'll have to speak with an accountant. But to for sales tax in the US, you have to have an economic or physical nexus. So economic nexus is a certain sales volume in a state per or pre previous 12 months. If you hit most states, it's hundred thousand dollars. So if you have hundred thousand dollars in sales in a state in the previous 12 months, you have to charge sales tax there for an economic nexus. There's also a physical nexus. So you have a physical connection to that state. So if you had a warehouse there, employees there, anything physical, you lived there, then you'd have to charge sales tax in that state. So being from Venezuela, I'm not sure if where you incorporated Wyoming would establish you incorporating there would mean there's a physical nexus, but there's not really any sales tax in Wyoming anyways. So I don't really think it would matter. But then obviously as your store grows and you have more and more sales, you will establish economic nexuses in various states, in which case you'll have to charge tax for those. I hope that helps. And for income tax, uh, that would be specific to Venezuela, where you're from, which I obviously don't know because I'm from Canada. But I just pay regular, if I pay myself a salary, I'll pay income tax on that. My corporation, the Canadian corporation, pays income tax corporate in Canada, but you have a US company, so that will be different for you. Question number three, is your free e-commerce e course enough to start as a service provider if someone has no investment? So I'm not sure what you mean by service provider, because it's an e-commerce course. But yeah, it's enough to get started. Um, you might need a couple hundred dollars to set up a business and stuff like that and get ads at least started. But the course is free, but I'm not sure what you mean by service provider. Question number four, can I register a business in my own country and use the legal documents to set up an e-commerce store in another country? It really depends on the country. Uh, so I'm not sure in Canada, there's a tax agreement between Canada and the US where you can have a Canadian company and you can sell in the US and not be charged sales tax. But some countries, for example, if you live in Europe, if you set up a European com company and then have it in the US, you will be taxed in the US income and European income because there's no tax trade between the country, uh, US and Europe. So it really depends on where you are. If you're in Canada, you can, but um, you can in other countries as well. You just might be double taxed. It might be more efficient to just set up a US company. But again, it really depends where you are. Question five. I live in Papua New Guinea, a country to the north of Australia. I'd like to run an e-commerce store in the Australian market due to the time difference between the USA and us. Is this the right call or should I find a way to make a US store work? I don't really think there's a right or wrong call here. Obviously, the, the Australian market is much smaller compared to the US, but you'll face far less competition there. So I think that that's a smart thing to do. Um, I would just recommend picking a bit of a broader niche. So rather than selling canoes, um, if that was what you're gonna sell in the US because there's so much demand in the US, maybe sell cottage stuff, a little bit higher niche just to add more products to your store in the Australian market because you will face far less competition there. But um, yeah, either can work. If you're in the US, obviously you'll have to hire a VA to handle your customer service or take calls in at unfavorable hours. If you're gonna do it in Australia, I think that's probably the right call. You'll face far less competition, but just be pick a little bit of a broader niche with more products just to make it easier on yourself. How long did it take you to start seeing consistent profitable sales? I got lucky, so my best supplier to this day was the first one I ever made a sale with. So I was making consistent profitable sales in my very first month. 
after launch. So I started in September, made my first sale in October. So I guess month two of launching the store. I have done one sale, $1,700 in the last two months. Should I pivot niches or add more suppliers? It really depends. What margins are you seeing? How many more suppliers do you have to add? Um, what's the branded demand for the suppliers? What's your store look like? Really not much information there for me to go off of. How much have you spent on ads? It really depends a lot on those things. So how much have you spent on ads? Is your store nice? How many suppliers are in the niche? What are the margins? Um, what's the, how many suppliers are there that have brand and demand? Consider all those things when making the decision, but I can't really just give you a answer based on your sale just without context. How do you apply for an EIN outside of the US? Just Google international EIN, IRS, and there'll be a number that you can call and get one. My most popular supplier has horrible customer service. They have slow shipping, horrible response time, and bad communication. Should I stop working with them? So what do you mean by most popular? In terms of sales, if you're selling a bunch of their stuff, I would probably try and make it work or at least talk with them about it. If you just mean popular in terms of demand, but they're horrible in every other aspect, I don't really think you need to like cut the cord and stop working with them. I just wouldn't advertise their stuff or spend a whole bunch of time uploading their products. I probably just would move on to a different supplier. You don't really necessarily need to cut ties with them to stop working with them. How do you optimize CRO? I am getting clicks on my website, but I have low conversion rates. So that is a very detailed, complex answer that I can't really dive into here because every website is different, but I would recommend you go to Amazon and Wayfair. There'll be tons of things on there to give you ideas in terms of how you can organize your product page to optimize. But the big thing is trust. So you want to have reviews, um, payment badges, customer generated content. So pictures of your products, just like a nice clean looking website, all that stuff will increase trust, which with high ticket is very important. Someone's not going to buy from you unless they trust your store. So I'd really focus on increasing trust and then have a clear phone that people can call you in a live chat so people can message in and get responses quickly. That will all help. But again, uh, look to Amazon Wayfair for ideas, but every single website is different. There's not really a universal answer for how to optimize for CRO. How did you go about hiring your COO? So if you go through my past videos, I have um, recommended hiring process. So I just did that. I hired her, she was, she, I hired her before we even made any sales. She was just like helping me upload products and stuff. And she just kind of grew with me in the store into her role very well earned on her part. What has been your biggest lessons in e-com journey? So I would say that even if it takes longer, especially when you're starting out with limited capital, it's better to learn things yourself than to hire an agency. And if you are going to hire an agency, make sure it's a good agency because a bad agency can really, really drain a lot of money from you with nothing to show for it if you're not careful, which I've unfortunately had to go through myself. That and just the other part is learning how to focus your time. So with e-com, there's endless things you can always be doing, like more products, optimizing your ads, doing email, doing CRO. There's just so many things you could be doing that it's very important that you learn how to prioritize your time to what's actually important. So learning how to prioritize what's actually going to make the biggest difference with your time and then learning to delegate and outsource, I'd say has been the biggest lesson. So don't hire agencies and stuff too soon to rush results. It's better to learn things yourself, implement them through your own employees and team members through SOPs that you've made rather than rushing and wasting money on agency who's going to give you maybe zero results, especially if they're a bad agency, and then learning to delegate and how to optimize your time. If you had money to spare and we're starting out, how much would you budget per day for ads? I would start at like $30, $40 a day. I think I started at $50 a day my first month. So between there, 30, 40, 50 a day, 1500 for the first month would be what I would allocate. I wouldn't do more than that, even if you have unlimited money. That should be enough to be able to tell if things are working. If you were to sell your business today, how much do you estimate it would sell for? So it's still a very new business. So in e-com, the longer you have your business for, the more it's worth. So it's still under two years. I would say between one and 1.5 million, if I had to guess approximately, is having a paid theme necessary at the beginning. It's not absolutely necessary. I guess it depends how much time you put into work on the free theme. I'm sure you can make it look nice. But in terms of functionality and looks, a paid theme will usually help increase trust and make the store look better, helping you get sales earlier on. So not absolutely necessary, but it should help. Is it necessary to include my picture profile on the deck? Not necessarily, but I would definitely recommend you recording it so they can see your face when you're presenting it to them. But yeah, I don't think it needs to be there. Some recommended CRO resources you can suggest. So I think at splittesting.com on Twitter is a good one to follow. Um, Josh Pavis is a good one on Twitter to follow. And then I'm sure you can just find other things on YouTube. But again, it's CROs, there's not really, it's kind of a difficult one because there's no like course because every single website is different. It depends whether you're selling $10 products or $1,000 products. Like every website is literally different. So there's not really a formalized, this is what you do. It depends on every single niche, every single store, every single price point. But there's just kind of general things, which is obviously increasing trust, responsiveness, and just like having a clean website. So I'd recommend going to those people I mentioned on Twitter, and then I'm sure you can find some on YouTube as well. 
As a non-US resident, what are the requirements to apply for a firm? So I believe you just need a US bank account, which you can get through WISE. That's what it was when I applied last year. I'm not sure if that's changed, but that's what it was when I applied. Could it be a negative indication if a few resellers solely provide us with free shipping while not offering any discount? I'm not really sure I understand the question, I'm sorry. We are big fans, well thank you. So they're, the brand is offering you free shipping, but not offering you a discount. Yeah, that would be very negative because they're not giving you any margin at all. So if that's what you mean, I would not recommend working with them. Do you wish you started SEO at the... Yes, I do wish that. Um, and I think at the beginning, just really focus on getting lots of good content and being consistent with your blog posts and your collection pages, and then really start building backlinks two, three months in. But really at the very beginning, you just wanna focus on content and at least kind of understanding like what you should be doing for SEO and then creating a plan for yourself to stick to over the next 12, 24 months, because it's really a consistency game. What are the main factors for you to start hitting 1 million a month revenue? I think just time more than anything. Time and building up your SEO adding more suppliers, adding more products. Yeah, there's really not a lot of stores hitting 1 million a month revenue, but I don't think that's re really the business model. I don't think there's any business model where every single one is hitting 1 million a month revenue in the online space that someone can just start with no capital. So I think the same with agencies, same with most you know, online businesses, it's very rare you'll see like a eight figure business. Like that's really impressive to get to that point. And I think what stops people from getting to that point is probably just giving up too soon, not continuing through. That would take years and years of work to get to that point. But really just more of what's got you to 300K a month, just three times as many suppliers, three times as many ads, and then obviously building up your SEO, your email list over time, but really not anything different. Are you able to provide a rough estimate of how much businesses in your program have paid to join? So they've all paid the same, roughly. We've had a couple of price changes, but the lowest to get started is 2100 on a payment plan. What makes your mastermind different from every other high ticket course out on the market? Well, I've been in high ticket courses in the market and <laughs> um, one of them was 10,000 people in a Facebook group, one one hour coaching call a month. And yeah, I think you paid four grand to join. And then you can pay another four to five grand to have a mentor 30 minutes a week for a year. So mine is way less than that, but you have a one-on-one -on -one coach, success coach that will meet with you as much as you want. You have their calendar, so you have a mentor included in the program. You have over 12 hours of group coaching calls every week versus one hour a month. You have experts in various fields. So a hiring expert who owns a hiring agency, an SEO expert who's driven over $50 million in SEO sales. Um, all the success coaches who are you have one-on-one -on -one access to have done over six figures a month in sales using the program. So they've won the program, seen success, and now are success coaches. That's included. Um, we have guest speakers every one to two weeks on specialized topics like SEO, CRO, Google Ads, um, which are some of the brightest minds in the space. You have a private Slack channel with myself and all the other coaches to answer questions instantly whenever you want every single day. And all that is for less than the cost of other programs. So there's literally just like a Discord server or Facebook group with maybe one coaching call a week or a month. So we have 12 hours of coaching calls per week on things like mindset, specialty topics, general Q and A, open floor. You have your success coach to hold you accountable to check in with you every week. You have their call link, you have a private Slack, guest coaching calls on like specialized topics. So really it's not, <laughs> I, I talk with my business partner about this. It's um, the bar is really not high to have a good coaching program. Most people are just marketers who happen to sell a course with a group, maybe some customer support in Asia somewhere who can answer an email once a week, but they're really just worried about marketing and they're not, they're just kind of trying to drive as many people into the program as they can through marketing. And they're not really actually worrying about the program itself. We're us, we're really worried about our customers and we're really, our main concern is getting the people who join results, which if you go look at our social proof is absolutely outstanding compared to any other high ticket course. And we've only been around for like three months. So you can look at the results. I think those do the talking. Are you a multimillionaire? So it depends what you mean by that. I do not have several million dollars in my bank account. I'm a big believer in like reinvesting into yourself, into my businesses. But if you took my businesses, the value of them, if I was to sell them today, then yes, I think definitely. How long after a customer abandons cart should you follow up via email? So I think we do something like 20 minutes, four hours, or maybe it's four hours, 12 hours, one day, something like that. Um, but I think SMS right away, um, email probably a little bit longer. What do you personally do about non-map brands? Um, some of them work. So I have non-map brands that work really well. You just kind of have to test it and see like what the variation is on Google Shopping. Like if everyone's listing it all over the place, it might be hard. But some of them will give you MSRP, which is like a recommended price that most brands will list at. And I've actually had success with non-map brands. So 
only one, but it's not like it's impossible. What other channels do you remarket on? So Facebook's the big one. Um, I've done Pinterest, but that's really it. I'm sure you could do it on more, but just I haven't really took the time to set it up yet. It would probably be very minimal return. You think minus 70 bid adjustment is too aggressive. So it really depends on the product type, but I would say you could start at minus 50 and kind of work your way up and see. But I think I'm at like minus 65 or minus 70 on most of my campaigns. How far do you think you can push your store? How would you 10x Maria at right now? Um, I think just focusing on SEO and getting organic traffic would be the main thing as well as continually adding more brands. Yeah, I think 10x is not out of the question on a long time frame, like four, three to five years. Do you prefer Ahrefs or SEMrush? I prefer Ahrefs uh, for keyword research and backlinks is definitely the best one. SEMrush has some cool tools like content analyzer and stuff. It'll like, if you put content into it, it'll make it SEO optimized for you. But for keyword research and backlinks, definitely recommend Ahrefs. I followed your free course in SEO guides. What should my next steps to be to scale? If you just want to stay with free stuff, just continue adding more brands, optimize your ads, building backlinks over time, and just kind of do more of what you've already done. And then obviously just improve your website, add email marketing, um, improve your SEO, add more brands, advertise on different channels. All these way, uh, are a way to scale, but I think at some point you'll probably need to hire a coach to kind of help you whether it's a one-on-one -on -one coach or a program, I would recommend that that will probably be necessary at some point to really scale and take it to the next level. It's very kind of hard to learn everything yourself. You definitely can, but um, will be probably a longer process. But that's all for the questions today. Like I said, this is only half of them. So I'll get to the rest. If you submitted a question and it didn't answer today, I'll answer it next week's um, video. But thank you all for tuning in. I greatly appreciate you all. If you could please hit the subscribe button below. I appreciate your support. Like this video. If you have any questions at all about anything I talked about, put them below and I'll answer them best I can. Thanks a lot for watching guys. Thank you for taking time out of your wonderful day. I appreciate you all and I'll see you soon. Cheers.